And now, everyone, please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to your host, Heather Torres. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for those of you that are joining us on campus and to those of you who are joining us online. My name is Heather Torres, and I'm the program director for the Entertainment Business Master's Program here at Full Sail University. And I'm here to host uh, the session titled Defined by Defiance, Hydro 74 and how his life influenced his work. So please put your hands together and help me welcome Joshua Hydro 74 Smith. This is good. So much for, uh, anybody want to beatbox for me? Oh, it's my fault. Okay. <laughs> Hey, thanks for uh, coming out this morning. Um, I, too, am not a morning person. I was up to about 3 a.m. last night playing Xbox when I should have been working. So uh, I woke up this morning going, shit, I have to get over here. So, but I do appreciate you guys coming out. And um, if for those that are familiar with my work, this is not really going to be one of those portfolio kind of talks. Um, there's a backstory that you know I, I hardly share, and I just figured it was time to uh, just make it a little bit more known, I guess you could say. And hopefully, at the end of the day, there might be something of relevance from it that you might be able to pull from it. Or if not, it'll just be a great story, something you'd be like, ah, oh, dude, you hear what he said? So uh, let's uh, go and start. I have just a few minor like housekeeping things. Again, thank you. I know it's early, so I'll try to make this uh, quick and as painless as possible, so that way you guys can uh, take a break. And then. I am not a public speaker. Um, I'm definitely no drap, drap, uh, draplin. Um, this will probably get awkward. <clears throat> uh, full sail. Um, I didn't go here, but it's cool college. Joking. Uh, so that's pretty much it on that one. And then, uh, again, opinions, they're like assholes, everybody has one, so whatever you hear throughout the whole time, just take everything with a grain of salt, and I think every speaker has the whole idea where they just want to offer something up, and if it resonates with you, then it resonates, but at the end of the day, just you know, take everything with a grain of salt and kind of see how it works into your system. All right, so it's a little introduction for those that don't know who I am. Um, basically, I run Hydro 74, and then a while back I came up with like this little kind of quote because uh, I have this bad habit. Well, I guess it's a good habit, but I like to make like little notes to myself just because there are times during a week or a month that I'm just sitting there and you know just you know the weight of everything's just piling on. So it's just kind of nice to have these like little blurbs where I'm like, all right, cool, yeah, I, I can get through this. But this one was one of the ones where I thought was kind of relevant to this talk, which is life is not about feeding off the past, but finding balance to embrace the now and demand more from tomorrow. Every breath is an act of defiance to those that doubted, the, doubted and the circumstances that wanted you to fail. Only you can make the choice to stand back up and fight for what you can be. Defiance is the energy that pulses through your veins as you lay beaten and not willing to give in. That fight pushes you to get on your feet, stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with life, and give rise to the courage that not today failure will get us victory, not today will you take, but today I will fight. So I figured that was just something that was one mostly personally for me, but it was also one of those ones where I'm like, oh, shit, I could share this. This would be awesome. So hopefully there's something kind of good there. And then, uh, see, where am I at? Okay, so yeah, this is the basic shit. So I've been doing this since about 1994. Uh, well, actually, I started college in about 1994. I was doing cartoon illustrations for the newspaper and all that. Really horrible. It was like Powerpuff Girls meets anime. It was, it was, it was ridiculous. But um, it was fun, and then uh, I actually went for elementary ed and eventually found my way into design, and around 2000, I s had like this really crappy site on GeoCities, if anybody's familiar with that, it's kind of like Angel Fire. Am I dating myself? Probably. Well, anyway, <clears throat> got a couple of gigs from that, and next thing I know, it was just kind of one of those things that kind of progressed. Um, I'm based here in Orlando, and I think that's kind of obvious, because I have obvious written right there. Um, See, I, and the thing, too, is throughout the whole process, I never wanted to be a designer. Um, it was one of those things where I wanted to go for elementary ed. And with this story, you'll kind of see where I wanted something that was a little bit more white-collar because I grew up very blue-collar. Actually, it was, I don't even know if there's a collar 
color coordination for it. But it was just one of those things where I wanted to prove that I could do something. I always thought elementary ed was one of those uh, jobs where it was, it was professional. It, it, you, you could do something. And obviously, I failed miserably at that because then I got kicked out of the program for being too punk rock. And it wasn't punk rock. I was just poor. So, I mean, Goodwill didn't have a whole lot to offer. I mean, you couldn't go there and buy, like, polo shirts, you know? So I got the ones with the, like, little knights instead of the polo guys. <laughs> anyway. And then lastly, is like uh, throughout my, all this time, uh, I've had no regrets. I mean, there's been many failures and many, uh, many problems, many issues. But at the end of the day, it's like I regret nothing because even with all the failures and all the successes and everything, there's always something there. And I just look back and go like, damn, it's like I'm, I'm just fortunate enough to be able to do this. It's not every day that you can wake up and get behind a computer and click a mouse. And if anybody knows what a mouse is, I still use those. So anyway, just saying. So. Where am I at here? Oh, my street cred. I worked with all these companies. I work independently by myself. 99% um, of those has come to me, so it's kind of rad. All right. <clears throat> so uh, here's the history uh, aspect on it. This is just basically kind of the agenda. One is, uh, you know, the backstory. I'm just going to kind of go through. And the thing is, it's going to be a little bit of an emotional story. I'm probably going to get like all twisted up on it, and I'll probably be going back and forth, because I've hardly given this talk. I think this will be like the third time I've technically given it. But um, there's a lot of stuff in there, and you know, we'll see how it goes. And then uh, the second part is uh, the reality. It's uh, you versus the world, um, just the circumstances of everything that kind of comes onto being. And then you know, obviously, too, there's going to be a section about defiance, because I get asked a lot. It's like, what do you mean by defiance? Is it, you, you need to be like assholes to clients? I'm like, no, that's not what defiance is. It, it's, to me, it's a little bit personal. I mean, you can if you want to, but you're not going to have much success. But you know, at the end of the day, you know, whatever. And then the last bit is going to be some life lessons. It's just going to be like little uh, tidbits where things I've helped. And I'm guessing the majority of your students, so I'm hoping at the end of the day there might be a couple little things in there that, uh, that the professors might not have ever touched on and that you might actually go like, oh, shit, I never thought about that. So we'll see how it goes. All right. So uh, let's start with the beginning. Um, this is just basically an introduction. And like I said before, this is one of those talks I've really hardly given. Um, and I know that a lot of... Um, different speakers get up here and they tell like these different like little stories about how they went to school and how they found design and all this other stuff. Where this one's a little bit different for me. Um, this is actually more of a backstory, and the backstory is it's cluttered with just a lot of chaos. And the thing is, as I'm going through this, the one thing I definitely want to point out is at no point in time am I trying to compare my past with anybody else's past to say that mine was worse or better or whatever. But it's the whole aspect where. It's what got me to the point where I am today. And it's a really weird series of events, but at the same token, it's, it was the one that set me on the path. And the one thing that's always really fascinating about this is when you realize out of every choice is how many different options you can have. Because if I stay with elementary ed, I would not be here today. Maybe if I stuck with elementary ed, maybe I'd be working at a university. Maybe actually, instead of speaking, I'd be actually educating uh, students. But it's like you just never know where the path goes. And just by one happenstance instance, you know, I chose this route. And the thing is, I'm very happy for it. I'm very fortunate. And so, uh, you know, hopefully that's going to be kind of decent. And then also, too, is this a refinement? You know, um, this year, it's like I'll be turning 43. So the, the whole thing is you start kind of realizing how precious life is to a degree. And I know that a lot of, there's a few of you here that are probably definitely older, and there's a lot of you that are younger. But the thing is, patience and everything that kind of paid off, those 40 years have been fantastic. It's just a whole awe-inspiring thing of going like, damn, it's like I'm, I lived over half my life. This is kind of freaky. So, but the thing is, I don't want to give up. You know, I, I still want to keep kind of charging through. Um, it's like, you know, the thing is too, it's like I'm, I'm, the work and the story, it's like, it's, it's who I am. So that's another reason why on the preference aspect on it. I told you I'm gonna get all like tangled up on this, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and then, you know, the other thing too is, uh, you know, ego to, or wait, oh, uh, life defines. So, sorry, I'm getting all mixed up in my keynotes. I do apologize for this. <clears throat> so on the whole life defines, um, one thing I want to point out on the, this part is that it's not necessarily the body of work that you do, it's how you live your life and what you do on each of the projects. As long as you're giving your all and as long as you're trying to always do your best and always trying to evolve, let life define you, not the work. Because a lot of people get caught up where they're like, you know, hey, like look at all this cool stuff I'm doing. Look how awesome I am. It's never about that because, you know, it, things go by into fleeting glance. I, I've been here long enough to see trends come and go. And I'm lucky enough where I've actually kind of remained relatively consistent. I mean, I became a trend for like a very short bit. 
Mark back off, didn't have any work for a while, then finally got to a point where people are like, oh, you're the old guy that's been around for a while. So just, I always just let life kind of dictate that aspect. Um, and remember, everything is just a momentary success. You might get a big project from Nike or a big project from whoever. The thing is, once it comes, it goes. And so you just don't know if anything else is gonna come back. So just kind of realize that everything is just a momentary success. It's not sit worth sitting there going like, I'm gonna be king of the world, you know? It's just the whole aspect where you have one thing, so just try to build upon it, but don't, I mean, it's just, it's not a guarantee. And then also too, it's like, just kind of always look at the bigger picture, just realize you have a whole entire life. When you're young, you don't really, you don't see that much farther into tomorrow, where I look way farther, like I'm always trying to plan like a year or two or three from now, because the thing is, it's like, I'm probably not gonna get the things that I want, but at least I can try to plan for it. I can at least kind of pave the path. And then, you know, just two, it's like, you know, you're always on the clock you know, as far as like age. It's just one of those things where it just catches up. I, you talk to anybody that has some gray hair and you can, they'll tell you, it's like, yeah, it felt like yesterday when I was in college. Or I felt like yesterday when I was doing this, because it does, time flies by so fast. And then the thing too is uh, during your process, just uh, for egotism, it's like the one thing I learned is I got very egotistic early on. I was kind of like, fuck yeah, I'm awesome. And the thing is, I mean, granted, there was some merit to it just because it was awesome, but in the same token, I realized that's, that's not who I am. That's not who I want to be re represented as, and that's not who people want to work with. And so I always just tell people, it's like, look, it's nice to have self-pride, but in the same token, don't have overabundance of it because at that point, it becomes kind of distasteful or it becomes kind of one of those things where it's kind of like, eh. So, <clears throat> so that's pretty much it. And then uh, lastly is just uh, foism. It's like uh, you, you have to stop kind of deciding to stop faking who you are and just be who you are. It's like if there's something that you're truly passionate about, like go after it. Even if everybody else is going like, that's a bad idea. It's like, there's no bad ideas. I mean, especially as a creative, you can make anything. So uh, just avoid all that you know, different stuff over there and uh, just have fun with it. So that's pretty much the whole blah, 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 kind of like chipper, hey, let's go. So uh, let's go ahead and start with like the backstory. And this is where I'm gonna probably get all like tongue-tied and there might be some emotional moments, so I do apologize in advance. So the beginning, um, one of my favorite lines uh, that I ever read was uh, in one of Ernest Hemingway's books. And it's, uh, you know, all the things that are truly wicked starts from innocence. And the more and more I thought about that, I was like, yeah, it's like, cause just looking at like, you know, people that were in my past and things of that nature, I can see how that was because, you know, I, it's just, the, everybody starts in this kind of innocent kind of mode. So uh, one thing that, I, I guess I'll go ahead and start. So in about 1994, I was, or I'm sorry, 1974, I was born. And so, you know, I remember a lot between my first five years alive. You know, it's kind of amazing. I look back and I actually can remember like different aspects on it where I was basically eating all the Lucky Charms or all the marshmallows out of a Lucky Charms box so my sister wouldn't get any of the marshmallows just being a dick. And then I remember getting a Cookie Monster cake and getting all mad at Cookie Monster for having the cookie that I wanted because that was my fucking chocolate chip cookie. That wasn't his. And so, and then also too, you know, because my sister, she was one year younger than me, um, we used to just go out and we had big wheels. And if you're not familiar with those arts, those are big plastic bikes with three wheels and going like do the power slides and all that. And uh, it was a fun time, and it's amazing how much I remember from that. But then everything just kind of changed because <clears throat> one day I was sitting at this kitchen table, and I remember it vividly, and it's kind of amazing what you can remember from you know, back in the day. But I remember just sitting there, and I was playing with the salt and pepper shaker, pretending they were robots, and I ended up knocking the head off the pepper, and it like, spilled everywhere. And so, you know, as a typical five year old would, I played on my sister, didn't think much about it. And then uh, that evening, my uh, dad came home because my mom had to leave because I was sick and all that. And uh, I remember uh, she gave me like a cough drop before she left, and I was eating this cough drop sitting on the couch, I think Hawaii Five-0 or, or some detective show was on. So I go into the bathroom, and then I open the door, and I see my sister in the corner and my dad over the top of her, and he's pouring pepper in her mouth. She's crying at me, you know, staring at me. I'm washing my hands, not knowing anything that's going on. And she just looks at me in this like terror, and then he yells at me, get out, and basically what Pop says, well, you do. So, you know, I got out went there. And then uh, it went blank for a little bit, and then I remember my mom got home, and there's all this cussing, all this yelling, and then I, remember, I still remember to this day my dad just saying, call the cops, call the cops. And I walk into the bathroom, my sister's laying there dead in the um, bathtub, and uh, I didn't know what to think of it. It was just one of those things where it's like, wake up, because you know, she was my best friend, because we didn't really have a whole lot of friends in the neighborhood, so it's like she was the person I played with. And so she was there laying, and there was nothing there. And then from there, just everything just kind of went to this whirlwind. It went from like this, 
idea where it's like I could have this great family life to like, holy shit, this you know, shit happened. Not that I was thinking about that at the time, but it was just looking back in retrospect, and it's amazing how that little moment changes everything. And that just started the downward spiral. Um, and so shortly after, my mom ended up, uh, well, my dad went up going to prison, <clears throat> which the irony is I think he got out one, the same year that I graduated, so that was kind of weird from high school. So that was a weird little tidbit for trivia later, I guess. But um, after my mom ended up, uh, her, she just went kind of batshit crazy to a degree, and I understand why. But, you know, she ended up, like, dating some guy, getting pregnant. Then a year later, you know, my uh, stepbrother, you know, he came into being. And then uh, about a year and a half later after that, she ended up marrying my stepfather. And he was a Vietnam vet, redheaded bastard. And the thing is, I didn't like him from the very beginning. And, I mean, for good reason. Because the moment that they said I do's, me and my brother, oh, we got the fuck beat out of us. I mean, we're talking about black eyes, broken jaws, uh, scars, and just, I mean, we're talking just total chaos. Because we were Smiths, and he knew my father, and he hated my father because of what happened. And so for some reason, because of osmosis, I was a Smith. I was exactly like my father. So I just, it was that. And my mom got the worst of it, too. So it got really, really crazy. And um, I mean, I just remember times where I forgot to water the dogs. And for those, of the, for those of you who are from the north, you know what a basement is. So I remember we had the dogs down there, go down there, and I didn't bring the, the kettle to uh, pour water into the dish. My dad took this metal kettle, threw it at me. Cracked me in the head, blood everywhere. He basically locked the door, so I had to sleep down there with the dogs with blood everywhere. I mean, that was just that was just a typical life, you know, living with them. And so it was just one of those things. And then, like shortly after, um, end up going to a foster home. One, I guess, it was one lucky day. I guess you could say I had this massive black eye, and you know, I tried to cover it because you know, when you're in a dysfunctional family, the one thing you always do is you always take care of one another. It's the weirdest thing, but you always do. So you're sitting there and you're going. Ah, oh, no, I got into a fight at school or a softball hit me. I forgot exactly what my excuse was, but I never blamed it on him. But, you know, they didn't see through that, so the babysitter called, you know, the foster department. And this is when we lived in Florida. And so I uh, ended up going there, and, you know, during that time span, we had uh, two daughters by my, uh, or two sisters from my stepdad. So technically we had three, or three of us all together, well, four of us all together, including my brother. So uh, we ended up all going into foster care, and it just became like this back and forth, back and forth, and for some reason, because I was the oldest, I think I was 12 at the time. Oh, sorry about that. <clears throat> um, I was the one that was bouncing around where the others, you know, because they were young. I think they are like five, six, and three or something. Like I forgot exactly what the ages were. But um, they were all able to uh, go to, like, really nice families, so it was just kind of going back and forth, back and forth. And then eventually, I was a lucky one where I was able to get back with my mom. And I was truly thrilled about this. About two, maybe three years into foster care, being with like five or six different families, living on every spectrum imaginable, being in the ghetto to Catholic family to this weird Christian right-wingist. I mean, I got the whole gamut. And it was kind of fun, too, because I guess, in a way, it kind of prepared me for life to a degree because you got to see every spectrum. But I was able to get back with my mom. <clears throat> and so... I'm there, and things are going great. We're trying to get my brother and two sisters back from the foster care system. And then, of course, my mom decides after my dad gets out of, or my stepdad gets out of jail, to get back with him. And so uh, I just remember he came home one day, walked in. I'm like, freaked the fuck out. I'm like sitting there, like basically pissing on my pants because I, I know it's coming next. But he, he, wo he got wise. Instead of uh, being physical abuse, he knew how to hide bruises because in prison, that's the one thing that they kind of share amongst each other. It's like, if you're going to beat somebody, you do, it, and you do it in such a fashion where it doesn't leave a bruise. And then everything became mental abuse on a, pretty much on a daily, weekly habit. It was like, you know, you're nothing. You're, you're pathetic. You're like your father. You're going to grow up to be a faggot. I'm sorry if you guys got triggered by that word, but that was a word that we grew up with. And my actual, my real dad, he was bisexual, and everybody knew that. So uh, it was just one of those things where it was just kind of hammering into me. It's like, you're going to be nothing. You're a piece of shit. And this is just a daily, weekly thing. You kind of get into a mode where you're used to it. And then there came a point where uh, my mom tried to fight back. I mean, we left. Or every time she would leave him, she'd always go running back. And every time the, you know, the, the, the abuse would get worse. Because he could beat the fuck out of her. He wouldn't touch us. Because you know, we were kind of like the people that's like, you, know, you, you don't beat the kids, but the wife's OK. And ah, she got it. I remember it, it, was just, it was pretty brutal. But then uh, my mom actually did stand up one time and tried to leave. And so we end up, uh, this is in Indiana, we moved, we, uh, I came home one night from uh, McDonald's because I was working a full-time job. Basically, that was my check support of my family because during this time, my dad was on, I think it was like methamphetamines, and uh, my mom was probably doing it too. She never really admitted it, but I think she was. <clears throat> and so basically, I was the breadwinner. I was doing full-time. I was actually in eighth grade because, you know, I was held back twice. So I was a little bit older. But I was in eighth grade working basically 30 hours at McDonald's doing, you know, junior high full-time come home, basically my checks go right to them. And so I remember one day I came home and uh, my mom there, you know, kind of 
blackened up eye just a little bit, you know, dad beater. And I, I just made this moment where I was like, fuck it. It's like, I'm going to grab this like pipe over here. I'm going to go in there and just beat that fucker senseless. It's like, I'm tired of it. It's like, there comes this point where you kind of hit this like tipping point where you just, where you just see black. You just don't really care. And so, you know, I was, I was like, fuck it. And not only that, it was just one of those things when, when you're an adolescent, it's like you just make those decisions where it's like you see black, you don't care what the consequences are because you're just done. And uh, you know, I'm grad me, and you know, before I kick into the house, she's like, we're just going to go. You know, I have the keys to the car, full tank of gas, but I have an aunt that lives over in Ohio. So I went in there, grabbed my sister because, oh, I forgot to mention before that, not the sidebar, but my brother and two sisters that were in foster care ended up getting adopted. So that was something I kind of forgot to mention in that one. But anyway, so they had another kid during that transition. And so we ended up... Uh, getting my sister, and we went to Ohio, and then like a day and a half later, we're driving over to my aunt's house. All of a sudden, the lights went on from a cow car behind us um, as we pulled into my aunt's house, and uh, somehow my dad, just being the guy that he was, had connections where he ended up getting her for uh, kidnapping and like some other stuff and like some other things that happened in Florida, because keep in mind, we were pretty fucking white trash at the time. And I mean, when people say white trash, I'm like, no, you haven't lived white trash until you lived, you know, what we did. It's like, it, it, was, it was pretty, it was crazy. I mean, when you move into a house that has like 666 and KKK in it, and you paint over and it's, you can't, get this bleeds through, and that's your bedroom. I mean, that, yeah, it's pretty awesome. But anyway, so I ended up going to a boy's home. My sister went to a little foster thing. My mom went to jail, and, you know, just, it was one of those things where it's like you're completely innocent, but you're around all these people who basically have, people that beat other people up for a living still, and, you know, just all this craziness. But for some reason, I got along with those people because we all had something in common. We had shitty parents, and so we bonded. So it wasn't necessarily that big of a thing, but then I was able to get back to my mom. And then, uh, Lo and behold, after my mom, you know, went there, and I remember we had no money, so I had like two changes of clothes. I had a white shirt, jeans, khakis, and like a t-shirt, and that's what I wore during the whole entire week. I was a master of mixing that shit up, so that way I could not, so people wouldn't identify that I was wearing the exact same thing. But I started making friends at the school, and everything was going well, and uh, my mom was, you know, working a job, so we were able to pay rent, have a little bit of food on the table. Luckily, there was like an Aldi's and like those cheap places where we can go and get like, you know, the cheap-ass meats and all that, but... We were, we were surviving, and it was good. It was without my stepdad, but then one day, he, she called him. He drove over to India, or over to Ohio. I remember getting off the bus from school, sitting there. Oh, it, was, it was scary. First thing he does, slamming against the wall, or yelling at me. I thought for a second he's just going to beat the living shit out of me. I mean, he's, he's, he's tried killing us before, but he was wise about it. It's like once you start kind of passing out and all that, he, just, he stops choking you, so you kind of learn the rules of the game. So, uh, you know, it's just one of those things where I'm like, ah, oh, shit. So uh, that night, just basically on eggshells, nervous as all that, get up in the morning, try to walk out quietly, go to school, came back home. Next thing I know, my stepdad's gone. Sigh of relief, but my sister wasn't there. So uh, my mom gets home from work, finds out. Next thing I know, she's panicking, trying to call him. He basically you know, took her, kidnapped her back over to uh, Indiana. And then that night, the cops came. So my mom was hiding in my room, letting the cops knock at the door because uh, she knew what it was for, so some extradition bullshit from Florida. And so uh, we ended up uh, walking two miles after the cops left over to a truck stop so we can get like a, we could hitchhike over to uh, Indiana, um, catch a ride. And my mom was willing to do anything for those truck drivers. And it was, you know, it's sad when you're w sitting there watching it, but no one wanted anything. So we ended up going back and we gave the people that lived behind us because we were in like this little duplex kind of, you know, shanty little thing. And uh, gave them everything that we owned if they can just drive us two and a half hours across the border to Indiana. And they did. So my mom ended up uh, going, trying to spend the afternoon, trying to suck it to my dad. Uh, he wanted nothing to do with her. Finally, the separation was legitimate. And uh, he's like, no, don't want anything to do with you. So we spent the last week living in a hotel. And at the end of the week, she asked me, she's like, you know, you got a choice. You can either stay in school or you can quit school, stay with me, and just kind of see where things go. And at the time, I, I always kind of look at it. It's like it was a tough choice because there was a certain selfishness. I wanted to stay in school. It wasn't because I didn't want to stay with her or all that. It was, or that I was expecting to be successful by any means. It was just this whole idea where it's like, I don't want to, it's like, I, 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 I'm not ready for this real life stuff. And it was a very selfish kind of moment. But in a way, I'm glad it was a selfish moment because she ended up dropping me off with a friend. And then I didn't see her until I ended up finding her like years later in, uh, in Florida uh, with a whole new family. And so... I ended up going into this, uh, my friend's house shortly after, back into foster care. It was all back, forth, back and forth, and then I got to a point where my aunt and uncle from my dad's side actually stepped in. Oh my God, I actually have family. Come to find out, six months later, I get kicked out because they weren't getting money from the government. So back into the foster care system, and 
I mean, it just, it, it really hits you. And this time I was like, I'm not doing the fucking foster care system again. There's no way, there is no way in hell I'm going to do this. So I begged and pleaded with a friend of mine, and I'm shocked because uh, her name is Michelle, and I'm, I'm shocked her parents did it, but they let me move in. I'm pretty sure they thought that we were going to, like, you know, get there and, like, do the nasty and all that, but we never did once. She's like a sister to me. And so I, I was very fortunate for them to come to my lives and be able to finish high school. And so that's pretty much the backstory. Oh, and, oh, yeah, and actually, you know, this part, too, the fear and stuff. But, um, oh, the one thing I forgot to mention is, I remember it was... My junior year, I was, when I got into my Michelle's family, my final one, I went going up to uh, the library, and I decided to do some research on my sister, and so I pulled up the article, and I was reading through it. The reason for my sister's death is because he was punishing her for spilling pepper. So her death was my fault. And that hit me hard. It pretty much devastated me for many years after, and it took me a long time to actually get through all that. So it was just one of those things when you kind of realize that, especially when you're a teenager, that... The one person that, the only person in your life that you actually remember that you truly loved, you were the reason for the death. Pretty nutty. So uh, that's pretty much it. And I think uh, towards the end, it was just this defiance kind of set in. And I think it was like the birth of it because there came this point where you had to kind of separate yourself from everything and you had to find a reason to survive because with all those challenges and everything else that kind of went through it, you're just like, ah, I don't know what to do. So, you know. It was crazy, and then I was getting ready to finish up uh, high school, and then all of a sudden, the reality, the reality starts setting in. It's like, am I just gonna be in the same path? Am I gonna be the same as the past? Am I gonna be what was already presented in front of me? Am I just gonna be nothing more than just a copycat of that? And so, it begins, you know, and I kind of realized too that, you know, each failure is a lesson that teaches you either to lay in defeat or stand back up and face it. And the thing is, I didn't know any better, so, it begins. I, I discovered the true word of independent because the moment that uh, I remember when I graduated, two days later, the family I was with asked me to move out. They're like, sorry, we got guests coming in from, uh, I think it was Britain. We need you to find a place to stay. All right. So I ended up staying with a friend. We went to college together for a semester, and uh, every break, because I didn't have a family, I was just basically hustling to try and find people to stay with because I didn't know any better. I had no money. I worked basically like 20, 30 hours over at whatever job I could get from Best Buy to being a barista and all this other stuff. And, you know, I was trying to do school, and I didn't have any money. I had to buy my own clothes. So, obviously, I was a little punk rock for the education system, like I mentioned before. And they didn't trust me because they didn't think I would be a good example. I went to a private Christian college in the middle of nowhere of Indiana. And the only reason is because I never had parental people to kind of guide me in how to do homework and how to, be, how to dedicate yourself to something. So, my SAT scores were like 600. Basically, you get that for writing your name at the top. And so, it was just one of those things where I just... I, that was my only option, but I, I, wanted, I wanted to try to be a teacher. And so once I found out I was uh, kind of kicked out of the program, and it just, I ended up being, I, I got all pissed off. I started taking a liberal art class. I didn't want a liberal arts degree, because we all know the liberal arts degree means absolutely nothing. It's just basically a piece of paper that says liberal arts on it. So it was just one of those things where I'm like, I just don't want to, it's, I got to figure out what I want to do. I got to figure out where I'm going to go with this. And uh, I ended up uh, just, doing like different classes and just, you know, basically I took all the bullshit Christian classes, like how to better your faith and stuff like that, but I sidetracked it with, you know, painting and drawing and stuff like that because that was the one thing where it's like I wasn't necessarily good at, but I could get it, I could get an easy A. I was very good with marketing. So if teachers like that doesn't look like this, I can market the hell out of that and at least get the grade bumped up. I was really good at that. So I pushed on that and then uh, they ended up uh, taking this uh, class where um, there's this one girl from Alaska. She was tall. She was like six foot and, you know, me being five foot nothing. Ah, that was kind of awesome, you know? It's like I was intrigued. Usually I didn't like tall girls, but no, there's nothing about her. But she was taking this graphic design class, actually it was visual communication. So I decided to take it. And, you know, the professors at the time were learning Photoshop 5.5 or 4, I think it was, and Illustrator 8 and 9 or whatever at the same time I was. So we didn't really know what we were doing. We were basically feeding off each other. But one of the professors, he uh, was basically teaching all the old school ways, you know, pre-computer, how to, like, do your layouts and stuff like that. And it was really rewarding, even though I didn't understand half the stuff that he was talking about. But I ended up just, like, doing all that stuff. And so I kind of found this thing. I, I put together a site, and I started kind of realizing, like, this is kind of fun. I, I mean, it was almost too much fun, because I was doing, like, like I said, really crappy anime meets Powerpuff Girls. I mean, it was horrible. But for some reason, I ended up getting, like, a couple freelance gigs through it and, you know, all this other stuff. And it was really, really crazy. But then, of course, during the whole process of it, um, 
you start to kind of realize that life starts setting in and then uh, for some reason it just takes one domino to start the whole effect of like all the other dominoes. I remember one night, I just, I don't even know what the reason was. I just went into like this deep, dark depression. It's like, I was on the fence. It's like, I just wanted to end my life because I don't, it was it's probably something even stupid. I wish I could remember, but I really don't remember what triggered it. But just when things started going halfway decent in here, but then I don't know what it was. And I just remember that night being in my room, like, you know, I just, I, I, I didn't want to live anymore. I was done with it. I started looking at the past. The past started weighing heavy on me. Like everything, I just kind of realized that I was, because everybody else is like, because when you're in college, you see everybody else that's doing a lot better than you. And maybe that was the reason right there. And you kind of realize that your lot in life was not this, you know, wasn't being part of this. Maybe, you know, it's just you're not cut out. And then, you know, because of everything that told you in the past that you're going to be a failure, I don't, just everything added up. So it's just, I was sitting there and I was one the, I, I, I was complimenting, it's like, how do I end my life? I'm just done, I'm done. It's like, I, it's like, granted, I'm only like 20, 21, somewhere in ballpark, but it's like, <laughs> I lived a lifetime, you know, it's like, I'm done. And so uh, being at a Christian college, one thing that I always taught you, and I'm sorry if anybody's religious here, but this is just my perspective on it, is that always going to prayer, you know, and I was like, all right, fuck it. It's like I never really had that moment where it's like I had that thing where it's like it gave me hope, I guess you could say. So I remember just being in my room just crying and praying, and I, it was probably about four hours, you know, maybe a little bit less. I really don't know. But it was just dedicated to us and all this, and it was crazy. Because during that time, nothing. And no, I wasn't asking for like some sign or some magical Jesus walking on water moment. I just wanted just that feeling of knowing that something has my back, so I'm just not in this alone. You know, just just know that there is a purpose. And I don't care what the purpose is, even though it's a work factor job and just kind of live like a normal mundane life, that's fine. But I just wanted something, just reassurance, just something that just killed the emotions of not wanting to exist anymore. And there was nothing. And then it dawned on me at the very end of it, and this is the aspect that just really changed everything, and I think it changed the whole aspect of how I attacked everything in the future, is I realized in that deepest, darkest moment that it's only you. I mean, sorry if you guys are religious, but I, I'm not, and I realized there's nothing, there's nothing there to save you. There is no lottery ticket to get you out of you know, whatever problems you have. If you get behind on bills, he's not gonna pay it. You have to pay it. You get into a problem, it's you that has to fix it. It's only you. At the end of the day, it's you. No one else is gonna, no one else really gives a shit because you might have family, but they're really not gonna help you. I mean, they're gonna give you enough momentum, a little push, but at the end of the day, the only people that can fix your problems are you. Do you want your problems to be fixed? Then fucking fix them. Do it. And it dawned on me, and it was like the weirdest weight lifted off my shoulders ever because I spent all my life trying to find people to stay with, trying to keep out of all this stuff and having other people try to assist me in all these other little problems and all these little things. And you know, I kind of realized that it's me. I have to make these decisions myself. It's only I that can get myself through this. And so I ended up uh, just going and, I mean, the one aspect I do take away from any faith is the act of forgiveness for, you just have to have a, you have to have a moment where you basically say, fuck it. Everything is forgiven. Everything's done because that doesn't affect me one bit. Today is my day because tomorrow I want to be something. And I didn't care what it was. I just didn't want to be what I was yesterday. And it just, it, it worked. It was like this little thing. And so all of a sudden, like this defiance set in. It was a defiance of the past. And, like, I'm not going to let that, do, you know, dictate me. And then, of course, like I mentioned before, I kind of skipped ahead. But, you know, the accent was that visual communications class, you know, with, with all the stuff and then getting some gigs, I end up working with like, you know, like some record companies, getting 500 bucks. And when you're in college, 500 bucks is a whole lot of fucking Taco Bell. And that was awesome. And so it was just, I decided to give it a shot. And then the one thing through all of it, I started discovering a little bit of self-worth. I never had that before. I never had this like thing of like, holy shit, people, I can do something and people like it. And it wasn't great. I wish I, I should put images here, but I'm almost too embarrassed. But it was amazing, and so it just kind of it kind of began, and then, you know, a few week, you know, a few projects later, and I decided to graduate from school. My first job, working at the silk screen industry, working with house industries, and build down forth from Alba days, and like all this other shit. But I was making 28 grand. I thought that was good money at the time. It wasn't, but still, I was like, I got a job doing this. I was a web designer for like a skateboard company. When I was talking web design, I'm talking like dropping stuff into Dreamweaver, if you're familiar. I claimed it as web design, but it was cool, but it was, it was hard. And I mean, the thing is, I almost gave up so many times. I was working, I was moonlighting all the time. I was freelancing, I hate that word moonlighting, but I was freelancing all the time just because of that. And then the aspect of defiance, because through all this, I had to uh, 
Oh, I'm sorry, I got a burp. I'm so sorry. Maybe not. <clears throat> so, sorry about that. But yeah, through all of it, it's like, it was like this confirmation where I started getting work. I started getting like a lot of these little things kind of going on, all these like beautiful things. And it wasn't great. I mean, we're talking like $25 t-shirts, 50, you know, maybe $50 if I'm lucky. And the thing was, it wasn't great, but it was, it was fun to say the least. And then I remember through the whole thing of it, it's like I ended up getting this project from Endeavor Snowboards. And keep in mind, my, like, I'm working a job for like 28K. I'm smoking like, you know, probably a pack and a half a day of cigarettes, which I'm shocked that the 28K paid for. But I was so stressed. But the thing is, I, did, I didn't want to give up. I was also working a part-time job at Best Buy just because I didn't want to give up on this design thing. And the thing, because I didn't want to work in a factory. I'm from the Midwest. And I don't know if, I can't emphasize that enough. In the Midwest, there's not a whole lot of options. And so I just didn't want to, I, I didn't want to. So one day I got an email from Endeavor and they offered like four or five K. Granted, it was Canadian dollars, so it was probably not worth a whole lot. But still, that was a whole lot of money. And we went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I was working in Adobe Illustrator, which is the one tool. Because I was a jack of all trades. I was trying to do everything. But I realized I loved Illustrator. I mean, I love Vector because you can make it small, make it big, make it small, make it big. It was awesome. There was no rasterization. It was badass. And so uh, throughout the whole process, I just it, it clicked. You know, I started figuring out how to use strokes correctly. And I still look at my files going, like, why did I do that? But you know, I started using strokes. I started learning how to formulate the construction of different pieces. And we ended up like, doing these lines. And then it was funny because once that kind of started, then next thing I know, I started getting calls from like Billabong, Etnies, Ni uh, Nike, and all these other people. I remember going, like, I ended up moving to Florida like 12 or 13 years ago. But I was down in Key West on like a little mini vacation. Nike calls me. And I was like, OK, cool. Yeah, I'll get this done for you. Turn right back up, went back home. Did the work. I mean, it was for Nike Pro. I, there's no way I was going to say no to that. I don't care if I was on vacation. I don't care if I was in the middle of talking to, like, you know, whatever celebrity. I'd be like, oh, no, I got to go by, you know. Because it, to me, I don't, you don't say no to that shit. And so I did it, and it was successful. And then many projects later, it just started kind of snowballing, snowballing, snowballing. And then through all of it, you know, I kept kind of referencing back. It's like, it's kind of amazing because each time that I do something, each time that I progress, it was almost like this act of defiance because I'm clicking and that's just, like I'm being defiant because I'm actually proving that I can be something if I choose to be something. And the thing was, I never wanted to be successful. I never wanted to be like a person where I'm you know, sought after in the market, which you know, I guess to a degree I am. But it was just a whole aspect where it's like, I never anticipated that, wanted that, or even desired that. I just didn't want to be what I was, you know, or be part of that. And so it was just all that. And then, I mean, it was crazy. So uh, with uh, Defiance, you know, to my past, the aspect, it just tomorrow became more important than yesterday. It's like I kind of learned this, like, little secret in life is uh, when you plan a trip, you just don't get in the car and go. You, you plan. You open up the map. You see where it's at. You, make the, you figure out the stops in between, I mean, especially if you're doing a road trip. And so I learned how to, like, say this is my destination, backtrack and figure out where I want to stop in between. And I got really good at that. And so I knew how to network with the right people. I knew how to gear my talents to try to get you know, recognized in those certain different areas. And so that was almost an act of defiance in its own right, because I started kind of figuring out like the system at play. And then, you know, at the end of it too is, you know, absolution. It was like, just looking back, it was like this mental reboot where it's like all that defiance, all that little stuff, it cleansed me. It got me to a point where I can even stand up here and talk about it. And it doesn't affect me like I used to. I remember I used to cry myself to sleep at night because I would think about everything in the past. And granted, I'm not trying to compare. I mean, people may have had it worse here and people may have worse, or I know people do have it worse. And I know there's even like little things in your life that kind of go on. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's just, there's not much I can say except for, I just, that act alone of just pushing forward and being defined to that, it was a cleansing process, and so it made it where I can actually, you know, talk about the story. And so we're going to kind of hopefully uh, speed this up here. I got the, the lessons, I guess you could say, the learning process. Um, I was working with this guy over at Nike. His name was uh, Jason Murphy, I think it was. And uh, he had this little tag in his, um, in his email, and I loved it. It's, uh, every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up, knows it must run faster than the fastest lion or it will be killed. Every morning a lion wakes up and knows that it must... Uh, run or outrun the slowest gazelle or it will starve to death. It doesn't matter whether you are a lion or a gazelle, when the sun comes up, you better be running. And so I always enjoy that because when that morning comes up, when I have my morning coffee, morning cigarette, and just kind of sit there with the Florida sun, which I truly, truly fucking love in the morning. I sit there 
and I started thinking about the day, and I started thinking about what can I do. And I have my lazy days, of course, but I mean, at the end of the day, I still, I push forward, and I, I try to figure out what I want to do next, and I try to figure out a game plan. I have those moments where I wake up, and I sit there, and I go like, oh, shit, how am I going to pay the bills? But then that's not the question, is it? The question is, what can I do to earn enough so I can pay the bills? What can I do to accomplish these projects? Who do I have to contact to figure out if they need something? So I start asking different questions during that, you know, 10, 15 minute morning wake up, little process that I have every morning, and it works. And so uh, the one thing I definitely encourage throughout all of this is, uh, I mean, you've probably heard this a million times, but find yourself worth. I mean, just, just know whatever you do, it's like, you'll always get better, but just find a confidence in the self-worth, because, you know, with the self-worth comes, did I hit, there we go. With the self-worth comes, you know, self-confidence, and having a little bit more confidence makes it where you are able to talk to people and have relationships and just, just kind of, do all the other stuff. And the one thing that I know that they don't teach you here is the pound of flesh aspect. Pay your fucking taxes. I'm not lying. It's like that stuff will come into play. And the thing is, no professor ever talking that, but learn, how, learn some basic accounting skills. Learn how to keep track of your shit because the moment you don't, you're in debt. You're screwed. It happened to me. Finally out. Just saying. And I'm not the only person, too. And then also, too, kind of realize throughout the whole process that everything's just one big frickin' system because at the end of the day, there's systems in play. You know, everybody thinks that it's a matter of how good you are. I'm not that good, but I was able to get with the right people. I realize that there's systems at play. I realize that it's not about what you do. It's about who you know, and it's about what you can offer to them, and it's about willing to take the risk to figure out a way to work yourself into that system. It's all about systems, and people get so caught up in, like, oh, I need to be the greatest. It's like, it's not about the greatest. Everything that we do is just because we know somebody or somebody takes a little bit of faith in us and how you deal with that relationship and learning how to work with everybody. And I mean, everything, there's a system. It's, it's, it's like this organism. And so the more and more you look at, the more and more you kind of separate yourself from it and just like look into it, you start realizing like the rules at play. And I know a lot of people th will probably call bullshit on that, but I've been doing this for 20 some years and I can spot everything. I look at it, it's like, no, this is what's going on. It's the same shit as yesterday, but it works. And then, of course, lastly, networking. I mean, don't bother with LinkedIn. LinkedIn's bullshit. I mean, you probably figured that out already. But um, like an event like this, take time. You have all these amazing people that are going to be either speaking or getting inducted. Not only that, but you have fellow classmates who have the same ambitions that you do. You might not be as successful, but they might be. Make friends with them. And if, even if you're one of the class that they make fun of because your work is not that great, Fuck them, my work was shit, and look at me now. And those ones I think that they're God's gift to design, they're the ones that fail the hardest. So you know what, doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, just not work with everybody, friends, just go out there. Because I, I guarantee you at some point in time, you're gonna be on Facebook and, or be on something, be like, holy shit, you're in a class with me, and find out this person's doing something that you wanna do, or you might be doing something they wanna do. Ah, that synergy is fucking awesome. And then, of course, oh, I already said networking. Damn it, I'm looking at the wrong screen. All right, we can skip that one. And then the last thing is uh, uh, the fuck it rule. There has to be a time when you have to sit back. And I, I mean, people laugh at me on this one, but there are times when stress will get in the way and you just have to say fuck it and step away. Step away. You just get your mind off of it. Don't worry about it. Because the thing is, you focus so much on the problem that you don't look at the solution. And when you don't look at the solution, you'll never fix a problem. So the reality is, when things get too stressful, I don't care if it's a relationship, if it's work, if it's this or that or whatever, if it gets to you and starts biting at you and, or and chewing at you, you gotta say fuck it, you gotta step away from it. You, you gotta figure that shit out. And then before you even go back to it, start thinking about solutions on how to fix it, how to better it, how to make yourself better in that situation. Because at the end of the day, it's not about them, it's about you being the better person. All right, are we done yet? My ass is getting sore. All right, so, uh, the, the, you know, goddamn, I talk much, yeah, but um, one, just let, never let the past define you. Two, you know, if you want something, you work for it. I mean, you're not going to get it right away. No one's going to just gift it to you, but the thing is, the more you work for it, the closer you'll get to it, because the thing is, t if you start today, you have a better chance of succeeding tomorrow. If you do shit today, you're not going to do nothing tomorrow. So start today. Start. I don't care if it's a freaking YouTube channel. I don't care if it's like you just going on, want to do like a little Twitch thing of you playing a game. It's like just do something today. Do something. And then, you know, lastly, or I wouldn't say lastly, second last is uh, confidence. You know, I, I have confidence. Even when you don't have confidence, play poker. Have confidence. Know that you are important. Know you're not necessarily a special snowflake, though I am. Cherish it, come on. <laughs> Joking. But um, at the end of the day, it's like, 
there's only one of you. Granted, there's a debate, you know, it's like we're one of many, but there's only one of you that experienced your own life the way you've experienced it. So just have confidence. You're, you're independent. And then lastly, you can ask any of us people with gray hair, time. Time is such a beautiful factor. It takes patience. And then last but not least is my Rocky montage. This is my video. Go on. Wait. Ah, there you go. So that's it, yeah. That's pretty much my talk. Especially from the Rocky soundtrack. And I'm under time, too. No way. <laughs> that was wonderful, Joshua. Thank you. Well, um, I'm at all this sweaty now. <laughs> you did great. Um, at this time, we have uh, time for some questions. Oh. No, we don't need awesome. questions. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to open it up to the floor for a few questions, if that's okay. Is that okay with you? No. <laughs> no questions allowed? <laughs> no autographs, please. Uh, yeah, ask questions if you want. Okay, awesome. So we have uh, our campus people here, and we have a mic over there with Victoria. She's going to bring it around to you. So raise your hand if you have a question for Joshua. Those of you that are joining us online, um, we have a moderator there as well that will try to accommodate your questions. So I'll turn it back over to you. Hello, my name is Victoria, and Hi, I'm Victoria. from Brazil. Uh, I wanted to do mostly illustration and motion graphics, and I wanted to ask you, how is it that you settled for a freelancer at first? Because I was thinking of doing the same. I'm graduating in seven months, but so I'm, I'm getting my, my things organized, where I want to work with. I wanted to know how you manage your work as a freelancer. Um, I'll be perfectly honest, um, freelance was just basically the choice that I made towards the very end. I mean, I've always independently worked because it's, you always need to be working. You're not going to bail yourself if you're doing nothing. Mm -hmm. So the one thing I always highly recommend is don't even worry about freelance You are going independent because find companies, work with them because you find people that are the companies that are the biggest, I hate to say biggest dicks out there, are the ones where you learn the most. Mm -hmm. um, I had one where I was working like 60 hours a week, maybe 70 hours a week, and learning how to get stuff done quickly, but I hated the job, but it taught me so much. And so work with people, because you start discovering how the stuff is. I mean, the one thing is, I, I, since I'm a college dropout and all the other things, mm -hmm. you know, people always ask me about education. I'm, I think education is important because it's a great opportunity for networking and kind of get some ideas, but the best education you can get is working for somebody. Because at the end of the day, it's like they can teach you one thing, but they'll teach you how to do what they want. And that's really what the purpose of graphic design is that right there. I mean, you can click a mouse and figure stuff out, but they have their systems. Mm -hmm. And once you kind of figure out that stuff, it goes from there. But I mean, always, always freelance, but don't, don't do that as like the first result. Work with people. All right. How, what, what would you like advice for someone that is starting? I cannot unfortunately go for like a side job because I'm an international student. So I can only work within my area. What would you? Uh the internet's ambiguous. Um, the thing is, you just put yourself out there, put a site up, and just go hunting for whatever you want. I mean, the thing is, I mean, that's the beauty of PayPal. I mean, have them pay through that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it, it doesn't matter. I mean, the thing is, there's always, people always assume there's obstacles when there's really none. Mm -hmm. It's just you're not going to get someone's attention if you're not out there. So make yourself visible. Um, figure out a way to make yourself visible, and then if. Even if you're not good enough, try to figure out who works at what company. Send them emails or actually send them like nice little packages or something like that. Like just take that extra step and kind of go above and beyond. I mean, I mean, I know it's difficult and it, it's always a challenge when you first start off, but mm -hmm. the biggest secret that no one ever talks about is the fact that it's, it's not that they don't know you or don't like you, they just haven't been introduced to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Hey, Josh. What's up, brah? So, uh, being an instructor here, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about uh, how you had to make a leap in pricing your work from small clients to big. How did you know, not just an hourly, what you charge hourly or what you do this, but a lot of students always come up to me and say, well, I don't know what to do for this. It's a small gig. And then they go, well, actually, I got a chance to work with, you know, Plan B or, or, or whoever. They don't know how to price their work. Could you give them some advice? Um, kind of. I mean, the thing is, it's all subjective. I mean, I really hate to say it. 
the thing that I always do is I play poker with the client. Um, nine times out of ten, I'm, most of the people I work with now I'm friends with, so I can bullshit with them. They'll come to me and say, how much? I'm like, I don't know, 20 grand. They're like, you know, we can't afford that. We got like 1,500 bucks. I'm like, well, I was actually going to quit 1,000, but, you know, cool. I got an extra 500, you know. But um, I always just play poker. I find out what they have, and then I usually, if it's, and I look at the time, too, because, I mean, sometimes they have small budgets, and they can't afford something. So if you go in there acting like, you know, you're the greatest designer ever, it's like, no, I want this, then it's not going to happen. You work with them because the thing is, at the end of the day, if they keep coming back yearly, you're going to be making some sweet cash off of them. Right. So what I do, I just I let them show their cards first, and then I look at what they want, and I make sure I get a detailed idea of what they want, send some emails, and I counter back. And, you know, if it's something easy, then I'll take the budget. But if it's something where I know there's probably going to be revisions or something's going to take a lot more time, then I counter, and it's usually about 30% more. So, uh, so it's not... So it's not so much hourly as it is. No, I don't. I would but, never work like, hourly. But because well, I like kids to do when they start off. At least in my experience, and uh, with some of the students, they go, "I don't know what to charge, like twenty-five bucks an hour or fifty bucks an hour." And when you go to the budget, it's a big leap, and I just see a, a big um, difference with them not knowing what to charge. But you're, you're saying find out what they got and play poker. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, the thing is, when you're working with, like, an art buyer, which they probably won't be working with or working with that, basically the boss is saying, because, I mean, I've been in the position where I had to hire freelancers. It's like, look, it's like, you know, we got 500 bucks to try again for three. Right. And I'm like, N I was always a nice guy, so I tried to find the middle ground. Like, well, I can do for, like, four, you know. But at the end of the day, it's, uh, you, you just got to play cards with them because if they came to you for, they came to you for a reason because they want your work. Mm -hmm. And so, in a, w in a way, you, you balls in your court, but don't get above yourself because you can lose the opportunity because much like the work I do, I'm replaceable. And so you kind of have to, it, 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 you negotiate with them. Right. Because I mean, the thing is, there, I, I've never noticed anything. It's like, I know what Nike charges per, you know, different graphics. I know what Lucasfilm pays. Like I'm pretty much counting them when they hit me up. It's like, okay, cool. It's going to be this much. All right. And so I kind of know what the rough numbers are. And so I just kind of gauge that, but you everything's so subjective. around too sometimes? I'm sorry, what, what? Based on turnaround as well, sometimes, if they want. Kind of, because, um, I mean, the thing is, I work relatively quickly, and so I, I, I have a different process. So for me, <clears throat> if they, like, say if their budget's low, but I want to work with them, I don't do the fucking Mona Lisa for them, you know? I give them kind of like a rough Rembrandt, but it's still nice at the end of the day. So I, I learn how to balance, where it's like, you know, even though I want to give my best, I still get my best, but I just refine it enough where I'm not investing all this time, because... You know, you can add multiple breast strokes, or you can do a very clean fashion and just kind of add the texture that you need and boom, it's done, you know? And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of the other way I kind of play it too. But I mean, at the end of the day, I'm never going to half-ass it. It's just I kind of choose my time investments and battles. Do you do or? I do. Um, usually when it gets after like five or six, you know, then I usually negotiate with them. I'm working with uh, Magic the Gathering right now, and it's been revision hell. But the thing is, I just want to work for them. And I'm just like, look, for every revision, you have to send me a box of cards. And they're like, yeah, we can do that. I'm like, sweet. So pretty soon, I'm going to be all like, you know, warlocky on Magic the Gathering cards. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know if that helped, but I mean, my process is way different than everybody else. How you doing? Good morning. Um, Good. First off, I want to say thank you for coming. Like everything you said, it really, you know, hit uh, hit home. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. But um, my name is Ricardo. Um, I'm 23 years old, and I want to dabble in everything as well as a designer. Stay away from my shit. No, it's fine. I, I, it's I, my I, turf. It's fine. It's cool. But um, you said a lot about those days where you feel like giving up or you, you question stuff or like the past ha still haunts you and stuff like that. I mean, everyone has those days, of course. I just want to know, like, you had a destination in your mind, and there's obviously times where you feel like quitting. I'm pretty sure everyone relates to that. What dream or idea, what motivates you? Because, you know, everyone wakes up thinking there's days where you can, okay, yeah, I can do this, and then there's days where you're like, nah, fuck this. So, <laughs> no, totally. Um, yeah, like, what, 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 what keeps your dream going, your motivation going? Pornhub. Wrong answer? No, uh, I mean, in all, in all seriousness, I mean, even now, I mean, with, you know, definitely with 43 creeping in in April, um, it's just one of those things where I don't, I, I don't feel like I've accomplished what I need to accomplish. And I'm not, like, looking for, like, some end result. I'm not trying to be, like, you know, obey or this or that or whatever. But um, the thing that I always, f that I love the most, and I don't, I, I think I may talk on my next talk, but the one thing I always try to do is I realize 
I know what work I suck at, and that drives me nuts because I suck at certain at different areas, and that that's a motivator. That makes me want to click harder, try harder. I love. I mean, Instagram. As much as I hate Instagram, I love it just because I'm going on there and I'll see like friends doing some work. I'm like, God damn it, they're so good. I hate these bastards. But then I look at their work. And I'm like. All right, game on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna improve you. And so when life hits you and you get all kind of like you know disoriented or I wouldn't say disoriented, but but sidetracked, I bring it back into focus. I'm like, look, the only way I can be better at this is if I better my techniques, if I better this. And my goal is it's it's I just try to, I, I try to plan like a few steps ahead, and but on the same token, I also try to plan like further ahead too. But you just gotta like if you don't have a destination in mind. Just work on that car, you know? It's kind of like a mechanic. It's like, you know, if, if the car sucks, it only gets better if you spend some time underneath that engine. I mean, you can have a little crappy hoop do whatever, but at the end of the day, you can make that thing look into like a beautiful, beautiful beast. It's just you got to put time and effort into it, you know? I don't know if that really answers the question, but if I, find that one thing to focus on and distract yourself and then push yourself out there. And if your goal is to work in LA, then start networking with people in LA, start focusing, make a, make a goal, follow the trends, push yourself in those trends, you know? It's just, it's a gradual evolution, I guess you could say. O'Doyle rules. <laughs> well, thank you guys, I really appreciate it. And, yeah. uh, Thanks for coming out, and uh, hopefully I didn't ramble too much on this. So. That was excellent. Yes, thank everyone for coming. Thank you, Joshua, for sharing all your expertise and wisdom. The rest of you, I hope you have a great day at Hall of Fame.